more. This is not some gimmick kind of tapping into you, your subconscious. I, I just want you just to kind of reflect for a moment right now. I want us this morning to worship the Lord just, just right here. There's a whole lot going on this week. We said part for any of you that just a few moments ago. We had to say I'll see you later to one of our church members, Jack Neal. Another figure we're going to go to, not directly related to the church this week, but someone who lost. People have been real busy this morning preparing homecoming out there working even right now while we are here. Let's clear our minds. Okay, God. I want you to speak to me. Think about who he is this morning. If you this morning say that Jesus Christ lives inside of you, think about how awesome that thought is. If you today know that the past that has haunted you and robbed you of so much joy has been forgiven by his grace, think about how awesome that is. And Lord, oftentimes today we come to you as a church. We kind of run through prayer. Time we need grace, therefore we pray. But today we want to worship you in this place. You are awesome. So often, Lord, when we come to church, we hear the message as it relates to someone else. And sometimes we're scared to face the message as it relates to us. How does it affect me? How does my life line up to this scripture whatever day it is that we are studying here in this church. So Lord, I want to thank you today for being real. And God, you're real even when I don't feel you're real sometimes. Lord, your existence is not based upon how I feel that day. And so I thank you for just you being real in our life. And Lord, I ask today that you would be real in our spirit. Father, I would love to say that I'm living for you. And the truth is that, uh, uh, Lord, there are times I'm living for you. And there's times I'm almost living for you. Almost living is not living for you. I pray today as we study your passage from sin, Lord, that we would be believers that seek every day, one day at a time, to live for you, rather than those like myself many times who just almost have lived for you. <coughs> Clear our hearts and our minds and help us to be selfish just for the next 30 minutes and say, what do you have to say to me, God? In Christ's name we pray. First Samuel chapter 15. You've heard me on many occasions, and I don't apologize for that. That's something I'll never get over. Telling you about the youth revival that I was a part of many years ago. And uh, how the Lord just really changed so many adults and young people through that special night, special youth. I remember the, the greatest, the greatest night. The greatest time that I've had in ooh, probably 26 or 27 years of preaching now was <laughs> that particular night. Uh, we didn't have children at the time. It was just me and Janai. And, uh, we, we, we loved the kids. They were like our children. And I remember <coughs> that night how the Lord was just breaking hearts. I've been to details before. I'm not going to go through all the details. But I remember the song that they sung at the end. I remember there's two songs I remember in the worship that is not like I remember the song that not I gave my heart to the Lord. I remember that people need the Lord. I remember that song and, and probably will never forget that song. And don't want to ever forget it. 
And I remember the invitational song that was played at night that I experienced one of the greatest sight seekings of God in my life, and that was a deep revival. And that was a simple song that every one of you know that says, I have decided to follow you. And you know, as I was studying this past week, this particular passage, as I, the song kept coming to mind. As a matter of fact, I actually finished the message, printed it all, and then I opened it back up and I put this at the very beginning. I put the words, I have decided to follow you. Because I think about that, and, and, and there's a point in our life, if you're a believer in Christ, that you made a decision. You said, you know what, today I'm going to follow Jesus. But somewhere along the line, we get off track. So somewhere along the line, we follow Jesus when it's convenient. Can listen, let's be honest today, okay? So many times, if we're not careful, we can get offended by what the Word of God says, and we shut it off or we rationalize it as it's not really speaking to what I'm doing right now. Can I tell you that today's message is speaking to every one of us and what we're doing right now? And, and the song just says, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The world before me, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow, no turning back, no turning back. And there's a lot of truth to that particular song. And, and I think today what we need to do is we need to determine, you and I, we need to determine to either follow Jesus or to stop pretending to follow Jesus. Because I really believe that in, in our country, more specifically our country than any other countries, we have excelled, we have become very good at simulating following Jesus. We know what the church, we know what the expectation of those around us is, so we live up to that as opposed to living up to the expectation of Christ in our life. There have been times in my life that I have lived a good life. Seriously, I've lived a pretty, I've lived a good life. And you know what I thought? You know what? I'm better than this person. Let's be honest for a moment. I mean, we've been there. I, I'm better than this person. You know, this person's doing all this. I'm better than that. And I hate to say it, but there's been times when I lived like that. I told myself that so I would not succumb to what I was really doing in my life that wasn't working. I did most of what God told me. And most of what this book said, for the most part, I was a pretty obedient guy. But the reality is I was lying to myself. You say, well, I was preaching. You know, that's pretty good. Don't you think it's pretty good preaching? I mean, really? That's, I was teaching a class. I mean, that's pretty good. I mean, if you're teaching a class in church, that's pretty good. Man, I know most of the songs. You know, I can sing most of the songs, and you know what? I even know some of the verses that other people don't know. So that's a pretty good thing. You know what? I'm pretty, I'm a pretty good guy, but the truth is, my goodness is irrelevant in the scope of God's perfection. And so I was lying to myself, and I was telling myself that I was okay, when in reality, I was not where I need to be. See, I want, to, I want you to understand this today. There's a lot of us, not you, but us. There's a lot of us that have convinced ourselves we are okay. We have measured ourselves with the standard of other people and we look pretty good sometimes. But we're still miserable. We're still not happy. We're still uncertain about what this peace the Bible talks about and we sometimes sing about. And I want to tell you something today. If we are putting on the pretense of walking with God, but the reality is we are not walking with God, we will not have that peace that God's Word talks about. Well, we're talking about a, uh, a chapter today in 1 Samuel 15. I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, then I'm going to skip 7 through 23. It says, one day in 1 Samuel 15, one day Samuel said to Saul, it was the Lord who told me to anoint you as king of his people Israel. Now listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies have declared. I, God speaking, I have decided to settle the accounts with the nations of Emily who were opposing Israel when they came out from Egypt. Now go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation. Men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. Now that's pretty long. But it's also pretty clear, right? 
The Amalekites had given Israel a hard time, did not help them when they escaped from Israel, I mean from Egypt. And see, sometimes there's a life lesson in here that I'm not going to get into today. Sometimes we think that we're getting away with our sin, but we're not. As Romans tells us, that we're just been, we've been extended grace by God. He's given us a chance to turn from our sin. We're not getting away with anything. He's just given us the opportunity to turn away from it. So the Amalekites thought everything was settled. They had shown no favoritism. They actually opposed Israel. They invaded. They were a band of marauders. They had given them such a hard time. They thought they had gotten away with it. Nothing was going to happen. God says, I don't forget. I want you to go and settle this score. And he says, I want you to murder. I want you to. And we hear this word. And we say, oh my goodness, God can't be that way. I want you to kill every single person, every single animal, every single thing that identifies itself with the Amalekites. And we go, why would God do something so harsh as that? God did that because he knew that if Israel and, and, and the Amalekites came together, it would pervert that nation and God had to completely wipe out this nation that had opposed his glory. So let's look at number seven. So then Saul, Saul now this is good, Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Hala all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the Amalekite king, but completely destroyed everything else. Wow, that's very cool. He captured the king and destroyed everything else. But according to verses 1 through 3, did he obey? But wait a minute, though. He, captured, he killed everything except the king, so that's pretty good, I would say. According to the Bible, that's pretty good. Look at verse 8. He, uh, I mean, verse 9. Saul and his men spared Agag's life. And here it goes, a little worse. He kept the best of the sheep and the goats and the cattle and the fat calves and the lambs and everything, in fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. So what we see here is we see that Samuel goes to King Saul and he says, God is going, God is responsible for this. He's going to settle the Amalekite account, and he's going to use you to do it. Now I want you to go, and I want you to destroy everything in there. Harsh, difficult, that process, but it's pretty clear to understand that everything means everything, right? So Saul goes, and he kills most everything, but he saves. I find it interesting, as I went back and read this passage yesterday, or this week many times, he says that he kept everything that appealed to me. Verse 10, the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal with me, and he's refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out all night to the Lord. Verse 12, early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him, someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. And then he went to Gilgal. Then Samuel finally found him and watch this. This is really interesting. When he found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully and he said, May the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's command. Even after the complete disobedience, when he saw the man of God, he said, With cheer. The Bible says he was excited. He said, Hey, man, what's going on? I'm doing what God asked me to do. Let me just bring a point here that I'm going to hit later on. Just because you feel good about your life doesn't mean your life is where it needs to be. Saul continues, I mean, Samuel continues. <clears throat> Can you imagine? I mean, this is real. We just, sometimes I just want to just read it and go home. Saul says, I've done everything the Lord. And Samuel said in verse 14, it's like you hear him between the eyes. He said, then what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and lowing of cattle that I hear? This is the evidence of the sin in verse 15. It's true that the, look, Watch this. In the earlier verse, it says Saul spared what was appealing to him. Now Saul cast the blame on someone else. It says it's not my fault. It's their fault. Look at verse 15, the New Living Translation. It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, the goats, and the cattle. But they are going to sacrifice them to you, God. How cool is that? Saul, like many of us, when he's called in his sin, he says, it wasn't my fault. I'm just the king. That's all I am. It's the army's fault. They're the ones that decided to do it. But let me just say, they decided to do it because they wanted to sacrifice it. 
So what I did steal the money, but the only reason I stole that money is because I was going to tithe off of it. That was the only reason. Then Samuel said in verse 16, I love this stuff. Listen to what the Lord told me. What did he tell you, Saul asked? And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel. The Lord sent you on a mission. And he told you, and I'm going to throw this word in there, specifically go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rest with the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? Verse 20, Saul justifies it again. But I did obey the Lord, he insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back to him Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. And my troops brought on the best of the sheep, stoves, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Not my God anymore, but your God. But Samuel replied, and then I'm finished. What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and your sacrifice, or your obedience? Listen, obedience is better than any sacrifice. Obedience is better than any position in a church. Obedience is better than what anybody else thinks about you. Obedience to God is the key to a relationship with God. Not how good you look in the eyes of your fellow man, but how pleasing you are to the eyes of God. And submission is better than to offer the fat rams. I wanted you and I to look at our lives for the next few moments. Because much like the Amalekites, God will to settle with us one day. Please understand this. I want to tell you something that we hear a lot of times as preachers, or we say a lot of times as preachers, and you hear a lot of times in the church. You hear people who've never met you. Revival speakers or television people say, I love you. I really love you. And I want you to know something. I really do care about you. I do love you. I don't want to see our church fail when you have. I want to see you find the peace of the Lord, and I want to see you be a threat to the kingdom of heaven. God settled the account for the Amalekites after many, many years. The Bible tells us that we all have an appointment that cannot be rescheduled to stand before God. And when we stand before God, we're going to settle the account that we have in our responsibility today. And when we stand before God and settle that account, no amount of justification or blame is going to get us out of God's judgment. Saul was given a specific order. And like I have done many times, he did it part of the way. We use the phrase, he almost did. God said, I didn't ask you to almost obey me. I asked you to completely obey me. And what we have done in the pulpits and the books and the TV evangelists across our world today is we have cheapened God's word. We have made salvation like ordering at fast food restaurants. You order it, God delivers it, and then you go on about your business. And we have failed to see, we have failed to paint, we have failed to accurately portray what Christ did on the cross other than one time a year at Easter when we talk about the cross. We have failed to share with people the work that took, that was taken from the life of heaven, from heaven's very light source to die for us so we could have eternal life. We cheapened the cross, we cheapened the suffering, we cheapened the work, and we just made salvation just a little word and prayer that you have to say and everything's fine and that's not right. And we've justified our actions and we say it's okay because that person's doing it so I'm going to do it or he's acting that way so I'm going to act that way or she's acting that way so I'm going to act that way and we have lied to ourselves much like Saul lied to ourselves. And we have failed to realize that we're going to get an account of our life. I want to give you just a few simple points today. Number one, God gave Saul, like he gave me, a very specific way to live his life, a very specific, detailed plan. We have tried, for whatever reason, and I do believe I know the reason, we have tried to complicate things. You go to a seminar and it tells you how to win friends and influence people for the kingdom. 
You go to another uh, seminar and it tells you how to experience the movement of God. You go to another one and it tells you how to share Jesus without any fear. You go to another one and it tells you how to evangelistically explode in your community. And we go to all these seminars and people teach us how we can tell others about Jesus. Don't make it so hard. As Shella shared in our new members class this morning. Let me tell you the very simple truth why we don't tell others about Christ is because oftentimes, and I want to be offensive to me and you, we don't know enough about it to tell somebody. Saul was told to specifically go and destroy every single person, animal, being in Amalek, and he refused to do it. You said, no, he did it almost. Well, almost is not enough. If I was swimming across the reservoir and locked him out, and I almost made it to the other side, that's not good enough. If I was running across the train track as the train was speeding my way, and you tell somebody, well, pastor almost made it across, that's not good enough. Right? You go home and you go to your work week and somebody gets ready to pay you and they you know what, we almost made payroll this week. That's not good enough for you. But yet we feel like in our Christian walk, almost good enough is just exactly what God expects. Let me say this. Do not complicate or over-exaggerate the Christian life. Let me make it simple for you. If you are saved today, it is nothing that I have done or you have done. It's everything he has done. Do you realize that grace is all on his shoulders and is bestowed upon our life? We didn't earn it. We didn't work for it. We didn't make it happen. We were fortunate enough to inherit it by his work. So when he comes into my life, it's nothing I've done. It's what he's done. But now that he has done that in my life, it is my opportunity it is my privilege to get to know him, to know what he expects me to do for the simple fact that I want to please him. Not because I'm scared he's going to punish me. Not because I'm scared I'm not going to get blessings this week. But just because I want him to be happy with me. Do you understand that we have messed up the Christian walk so it is a, a game of you pull the roulette thing down and if, the, if everything spins in your favor, you get a prize called a blessing. That is not it. We should want to serve God. We should want to read his word and talk to him just because we want to please him and he be happy with us. Saul was given a specific detailed command that he chose to do what he wanted to do or watch this, what he thought was best. As opposed to what God thought was best. What has God commanded you to do that you're not completely doing? Let me just give you a few simple things. I know teams go to camp and they come back to this renewed zeal. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm not going to talk this way or look at these things on the phone and, and I'm not going to act this way around the office of sex. I'm going to do all these things and you may actually, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to use drugs, I'm going to do all these things here. I'm going to serve God, but then you go home and you disrespect your mom and dad. You're almost, and almost is not enough and God's not going to go, what? I am so proud of little Bryson. I am so proud of him because he is almost obeying me. No, the Bible tells us that these sins, no matter how we scale them, are all sins in his life. So you've got a teenager who's not doing all of these things and is not pleasing God because he's not doing this because he's still disrespecting his mom and dad and God says it's like witchcraft. you got husbands and wives. you got moms and dads. You've got individuals, husbands. This is I'm not unfaithful to my wife and I'm not doing all these things. I'm not looking at pornography behind the scenes. I'm not doing all of these things to her. But are you loving her as Christ told you to love her? Because you can always be a good husband, but that doesn't mean we're doing what he wants us to do. I knew this message was going to be popular, and I don't think there's going to be a lot of CDs made by. Well, I'm saying, man, I try to make a good home, and I try to be the best wife I can possibly be, but they show disrespect and disdain to their husbands. We say, I give myself over and over to God, but yet we don't hide. You understand? You see what I'm saying? We have become comfortable making excuses for what we do not do by exemplifying the things we do. 
So I'm doing all this over here, so it's okay if I don't do what God wants me to do. I go to church every time the doors are open. It's okay if I don't read this book. Oh, man, I read this book every day. It's okay if I don't give to the Lord. Hey, man, I give to the Lord. It's okay that I don't pray. Can I tell you something? God didn't save me so I can almost serve him. He saved me so I can simply serve him. So he gave him a specific command. Number two, very quickly, Saul almost followed the instruction. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I kind of did that in the introduction. Almost living is very selfish. In verse 9, it says, Saul walked with his men, spared a gag, and kept the best, named all these animals that appealed to him. Can I just simply say this, and I'll make it as quick and as simple as I can. Do you know why we almost serve the Lord most of the time? Because I don't mind serving God as long as it doesn't affect the way I want to live my life. Think about it for a minute. Man, I need to, I'm going to get me a recliner and put it here so one day I can sit back and preach. <laughs> Keep my chair back, you know. Just kind of kick back and talk to you guys. Think about this for a minute. The things I do in my life that God may not be pleased with is not for any other reason other than I just don't want to do it. It's about me. Saul kept everything that was best for it that he liked, that he found pleasing, that he thought he could make some money off of. It was about him. And I'm telling you, when we learn to live the almost Christian or when we live the almost Christian life, it's because it's no longer about him, it is about me. You know what, I man, it's not that big of a deal. If I watch this, I mean, it's all around the world today. And you know what, uh, uh, it's, you know, it's not really considered pornography because it's on, uh, you know, a regular TV station or, or, or a series. It's not really considered that bad or it's not really that bad to, to you know, hang around this type of person here because, you know what, I, I'm not necessarily doing it. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not addicted to that. And we make all these excuses so we can feel better about us doing what we want to do. And almost living is almost certainly going to cause you to be discouraged, sad, empty, live a life in which there is no production for Christ. Saul almost followed the instructions. Number three, I love this. Saul, Saul, it's a tongue twister. Saul, Saul, no, nothing, not one thing wrong with what he did. He just Verse 13, it says that Saul greeted him cheerfully. Saul was, he had done wrong. He had disobeyed God. And when he saw him in church on Sunday morning, he said, hey, brother, good to see you. Isn't that amazing? Saul was not concerned about his sin. He justified it in his mind. And therefore, he saw nothing wrong with that. And let me say to you, in my own life, if I justify sin, it doesn't make it any less a sin. I can bring a cup here and pour poison in it and tell you how good it tastes and how beautiful it is. It is still poison no matter how I describe it. And sin is still sin no matter how you and I describe it. Listen to me. You don't think sin's a big deal? Just go back and read in all the Gospels what happened to Jesus on the cross. It didn't happen to create a movement. It happened to pay for sin. He did what was wrong, and he saw no crime in it. He cheerfully greeted him. He acted spiritual, even as disobedient. Listen, we can act like we're godly. We can act like everything's fine. But that doesn't take away the fact where our heart is really at. Saul acted spiritual. He acted like the best church member when he saw Samuel. Greetings, he said, may the Lord bless you. Then he says something else, which confirms what I just said, and I'm going to move on. He said, I've done what the Lord commanded. That's one of the saddest things. <clears throat> Saul had convinced himself that even in his complete disregard for the Lord's command, that I've done not. I have found myself so many times, and I'm just being honest with you in my past, justifying my actions. In 
convincing myself that I've done wrong. When God's word tells me I'll And I make this a little more personal. When it comes to his word, God doesn't care how you do. He cares that you obey his word. You know, preacher, I feel that this is the one I do. You know that? When I'm praying, God doesn't say, shh, heaven, stop. I want to hear how Johnny feels about this. God doesn't care about how we feel in relation to his obedience. He cares that we obey him completely. And in verse 16 and 19, number 4, the truth always expels a lie. Do you not understand? In verse 16, Samuel says, stop, listen. I love that because there's such a lesson in that. He says, if you just stop justifying, if you just stop talking, if you just stop pretending, and you start listening to what God says, then you would not be in this predicament. Let me say this. If we would stop, if I would stop justifying, if I would stop making rational reasoning for my actions, and I would just start listening to what God has to say, then my life would take a turn for his glory instead of my faith. Stop and listen, he said, to what God has to say. Are we scared to listen? Aren't you a little scared to listen sometimes because of what he might say? I'm scared to listen because he might tell me something that I don't want to hear. Saul was too busy talking and planning to listen. This is not the only time Saul refused to listen. And then the last thing I want to share with you today is that the heart comes first, and the acts come later. Let me explain that in verses 22. Want to put it all together? Samuel came to God. I mean, God came to Samuel, and Samuel, and he told Samuel, I want you to go to King Saul, and I want you to tell him that I have, doesn't matter what Samuel has, I have decided to settle this way. Be specific. Samuel goes to King Saul and he says, I need to talk to you. And Saul says, You come with whatever is in your heart. And Samuel said, God is calling King Agag of Emily. He's calling him to justice right now. I want you to go and I want you to destroy everything that they have so they will no longer be, they will be nothing more than a member of this land. Saul says, Okay, I come. Saul goes to battle in the battle. He says, you know what? That cow looks pretty good. I mean, that would look good on the green pastures. Oh, those sheep, we could get a lot of clothing out of those sheep. Oh, man, I could ride that steed. Oh, man, that, that horse would be great for, for my, my stables. And he begins to pick and choose things that really appeal to him, the Bible says. It was a trophy to take the king and bring it home and, and parade him in front of all the kingdom to show your power. It wasn't because he liked King Agag. He wanted to show authority. He wanted to show power. He wanted people to, to, to clap for him. He wanted people to praise him. He wanted people to acknowledge him. And so he does exactly what God says almost. And then when he comes back, he's met by Samuel. And Samuel says to him, Did you do what God asked you to do? He said, I certainly did in the name of Jesus. I did. Samuel says, would you just shut your mouth and listen? Because you've been justifying your actions for so long, now God's going to call you into account just like he did in my day. He made that. Just because you feel good about your sin doesn't mean your sin is okay. And then he closes with this awesome verse 22 and 23. He says, God's not concerned with how shiny your crown is. God's not concerned with how the men and women applaud you when you march back into the city. God's not concerned with your actions, your sacrifices. He says, God wants you to obey. He wants you to listen. Can you imagine going to work tomorrow? Your boss comes up to you and says, hey, I want you to do this. And he begins, or she begins to lay you it out. And, and once they tell you what to do in two or three steps, you go, you know what, that's not that bad. And, and they go on about their day. They have a busy day. When they come back, they go, hey, did you get everything done? He said, no, no. And they go, really? Did you have a problem? Did something happen? Did you, did you 
computer shut down, the system shut down, and you go, no, you know what, I just failed, but I just want to do one of these things. Matter of fact, I felt like you could probably do the other two better than I could. I want you to send me a letter and let me know how that day goes. Because I can imagine what the world is very good. And if a human loss can set expectations and without question expect us to follow it, how much more can a heavenly father who knows what's best for us set forth an expectation and expect us to obey it? I challenge the sinner today. Very simple. I want us all to look at our lives and ask ourselves this question Are we living the Christian life like we think we should be lived, or are we living the Christian life like God is living? No justification, no excuses. Just being honest with yourself and say, God, today, I want to almost obey the rule of God. I want to live a life for you, Lord. Would you pray with me? You don't have to stand up. I just want to dismiss us in prayer in just a moment. I want to ask you a question. Have you found yourself like I have many times, almost obeying God? Doing most of what we should do, but justifying the other thing? Maybe we come to church and we don't read His Word. Maybe we study for our Sunday school lesson, but we don't spend time praying for others. Maybe, maybe we have refused some sins, but we've embraced others because we, we have categorized them as not that big of a deal. Guys, I'm just being honest with you. This is not talking about living a life of perfection. This is talking about living a life that brings him on. I just want to pray with you today. Father, just a moment, we're going to go outside and view the day that you created. We're going to eat the food that you have allowed us to sit down and eat. But God, I pray that you would. I pray that you would convict us. Convict us of our justifiable sin. Lord, I know you can. Speak to us a still small voice. I know there are times that you can allow circumstances to cause our eyes to look on it, Lord, and there's times that you can shake our very world so that we have no option but to listen. And God said today, I just ask that you would speak to us to begin with in a still small voice. That Lord, you would speak to our hearts about things that we need to stop justifying, to stop almost obeying, and to Commit ourselves to you, Lord. We do not want you to be committed to us like we are to you. God, that would scare me to death. Father, I thank you for this opportunity you've given us to be together. Lord, as we are here, just in this sentence, this sentence, this dismiss to go be together, I pray that you would bless our food and our time. Lord, may we focus this week on obedience, obedience, fully obeying you and not partially. In Christ, your name alone, amen. Thank you so much for being here. I do want to encourage you to come eat with us today on the grounds. Take an opportunity to get to know people. God bless you.